And welcome to today's webinar on infant and toddler homelessness across 50 states, 21 to 22 data. We are so glad you have joined us today. Just a few housekeeping reminders about today's session. This webinar is scheduled to last one hour and 15 minutes. We're going to ask that you type your questions into the Q&A box that you see on your control panel. That is how we will moderate questions at the end of the webinar and the end of presentations for our panelists. Um, I'll remind you that this session is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording as email follow-up after today's session, and we'll also post it on Schoolhouse Connections archived webinars page. You'll receive a certificate for attendance in your email automatically, and we encourage you to sign up for our Schoolhouse Connection Slack community, where we'll continue the conversation after the webinar. If there are other questions and ideas you'd like to share, our Schoolhouse Connection team will be on standby over on Slack, so we hope that you'll join us. A little bit about Schoolhouse Connection, in case you are not familiar with us. First, my name is Erin Patterson, and I'm the Director of Education Initiatives. And from the Schoolhouse team, I'm joined today by Sarah Vrabic, our Early Childhood Senior Program Manager, who I will turn it over to in just a few minutes. Um, if you're not familiar with Schoolhouse, we are a national nonprofit advocacy organization. And our mission is overcoming homelessness through education from prenatal to post-secondary. We work at this mission on a number of levels, including federal and state policy and advocacy, practical assistance to early childhood development providers, K-12 school districts, and institutions of higher education. And we always say the jewel in our crown is our network of young scholars who have themselves experienced homelessness and who we are privileged to support, both through financial scholarship assistance as well as case management support. We encourage you to check out our website, schoolhouseconnection.org. You can find lots of questions there that we've already answered um, from the field, um, and you can find lots of links to tools and resources that might be helpful in your role. By the end of this session today, here's what we hope. We hope that you will have a better understanding of the impacts of homelessness on expectant parents, infants, and toddlers. We hope that you will learn what new data reveals about the prevalence of homelessness and access to early childhood development programs for infants and toddlers. And we really hope that you'll hear some new and innovative strategies and best practices from our providers here today and systems leaders that can increase access to services for our infants, toddlers, and expectant parents who are experiencing homelessness. With that, I invite my colleague, Sarah, to join and she'll provide an overview of our issue today. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you so much, Erin. Hi, everyone. Like Erin mentioned, I'm Sarah Vrabic. I'm the Early Childhood Senior Program Manager at Schoolhouse Connection. And I will be starting with a little context for us today. So we like to start by grounding ourselves in the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness, which defines homelessness as children and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. This can look like living in motels, campgrounds, hotels, due to a lack of alternative adequate accommodations. It can look like living in cars, abandoned buildings, or substandard housing, staying in emergency, transitional, or domestic violence shelters, and of course, sharing the housing of others due to economic hardship, loss of housing or similar reasons. And this circumstance of homelessness is commonly referred to as doubled up. We know the majority of young children and their families who are experiencing homelessness in the United States are in this doubled up circumstance. And doubled up homelessness in particular is now receiving more visibility. So we wanted to bring your attention to a piece that was recently published in the New York Times that you'll see here that has done a really great job of portraying the everyday experiences and challenges of young children and their families who are in these doubled up circumstances. So we encourage you to explore this piece further when you can. Next slide, please. So families often will stay with others temporarily because there may be a lack of shelter availability in their community, but there also may be fear of having their children removed from their custody if they identify as experiencing homelessness. And I'm sure many on this call 
also understand that there is fear of the stigma that is related to experiencing homelessness. Staying with others can put infants, toddlers, and other family members in harmful conditions and vulnerable circumstances that can also contribute to developmental delays for young children. Next slide, please. Homelessness in infancy has been found to be associated with delays in language, literacy, and social emotional development. And these delays can put children at risk for later academic problems. We also know that there is a greater cumulative toll on the negative health outcomes the younger and longer a child is experiencing homelessness. And that even once families are stably housed, the impacts of homelessness on young children can be long lasting, particularly for their school readiness. Next slide, please. A really significant piece of evidence that we have of this academic impact is that the high school graduation rate for students experiencing homelessness is 68% compared to 85% for all other students. And notably, this is the lowest graduation rate of any student subgroup, including students who are economically disadvantaged. We also know that high school students who experience homelessness are 10 times more likely to become pregnant or to get someone pregnant. And that homelessness in the earliest years can lead to social emotional challenges and long-term trauma. Next slide, please. So knowing the potential negative effects and impacts that an experience of homelessness can have on a young child, we also know that access to high quality early childhood developmental programs can mitigate these impacts and these effects. And programs like you can see on the slide have federal requirements to prioritize young children and their families experiencing homelessness in enrollment and regular attendance. Some examples include the fact that homeless families are categorically eligible for early Head Start and Head Start programs. And these programs are even allowed to reserve slots for homeless infants and toddlers and expectant parents. HUD homeless assistance programs are required to designate a staff person to ensure that young children, including infants and toddlers, are enrolled in early childhood programs. And early intervention services must be made available to infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. So even with these really critical requirements that prioritize young children and families experiencing homelessness in enrollment and in attendance of these programs, families experiencing homelessness will still encounter challenges and barriers to access. Families who are experiencing homelessness often are highly mobile. They may be moving in and out of hotels or motels or even sharing the housing of others in multiple different places. They also may not have reliable access to transportation or have the documentation on hand that is typically required for enrollment in a high quality early childhood developmental program, an example including immunization records. There also might be a lack of awareness within the early care providers in their community. Both of the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness and all of the different circumstances that it encompasses but also of the best ways to reach families experiencing homelessness and help them with that enrollment and regular attendance and participation. So that's one of the reasons why we do webinars like we're doing today to spread that awareness, to be able to showcase best practices and to increase that knowledge base. So with that being said, I will turn it to Erin who will lead us into our data portion of the webinar today.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was the perfect setup for today's conversation and um, exactly why we released this first ever report on infant toddler homelessness across 50 states. And so as we uh, dove into the data, we wanted to first uncover what already exists. What do we already know about how families and infants and toddlers are quantifiably experiencing homelessness? And so I'll first share some national broad data points, um, including we know that 16, there's been a 16% increase in the number of families staying in homeless shelters or who are visibly unsheltered. And this is from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. And as Sarah noted, our definitions are different. And so when HUD says there's a 16% increase in homelessness among families with children, that's only among those who are seen in shelters. And as Sarah noted, um, doubled up families are often hidden um, and they are not visible um, to the public. And so a 16% increase in what we can see signals that there is likely a more significant increase in what we are not seeing. We also know from new research from the eviction lab that babies are actually the age group at greatest risk of eviction. Um, and this is followed by all children under the age of five. Um, and we've linked here to that research. We also um, conducted a webinar in January showcasing this research. And notably, about a quarter of Black babies and toddlers in rental households face the threat of eviction in a typical year. And so it's important to note that as we're talking about eviction, as we conjure images in our head of families who are being evicted, um, we have to name babies. We have to name infants and toddlers as human beings who are being impacted by this crisis. Nationally, we also know that 15% of infants and toddlers live in crowded housing. This is from our partners at Zero to Three in their 2023 State of Babies yearbook. And of course, living in crowded housing is known to jeopardize child development. Um, we also know that 2.9% or about 3% of babies and toddlers have moved three or more times since birth. And so that transiency, that instability of routine and living condition um, certainly has impacts on child development. And as Sarah noted, pregnancy and parenthood may increase the risk of youth homelessness. And so in addition to our youth risk behavior survey data, we also know that young parents had three times the risk of experiencing homelessness compared to their non-parenting peers. And actually this is the second highest risk factor for young adult homelessness, second only to lacking a high school diploma or GED. And so we sought out at Schoolhouse Connection to dive more deeply into how homelessness is impacting infants, toddlers, um, and their families across all 50 states. This is the first ever analysis, the first ever state-by-state -state look at this data. Um, and here's what we've discovered. Um, our key takeaways include that across 50 states, there are an estimated 364,390 infants and toddlers ages birth through three who are experiencing homelessness. And yet only 11% of them are currently identified and served by an early childhood development program. Those programs that we analyzed include early Head Start, home visiting, we included data from two large home visiting models, um, and local education agency data. And so it's important to note here that 11% of our estimated infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness are being shown as enrolled, but there is more data out there to uncover, and we are hopeful that more are being served. What that means though, is that about 89% of infants, toddlers, and young children experiencing homelessness are currently not being identified or are not enrolled in an early childhood development program. And this is significant because as Sarah shared, the impacts of homelessness on infants and toddlers in particular are outsized and they can be long-term. And it's that connection to early childhood development programs that can make a key difference, not just for our infant and toddler development, but for increasing access to other services for their families. Some key takeaways, number one, are that infants and toddlers who are experiencing homelessness are significantly under-enrolled in early childhood development programs, and this is concerning. 
We also noticed some gaps in data, um, namely um, that data about expectant parents who are experiencing homelessness is severely lacking. We do not yet have a singular data point that we can point to to say, here is the quantifiable problem. But we know from other research that pregnancy and homelessness are both risk factors for the other. Um, we also observed that very few states take full advantage of the flexibilities that are offered to support infants, toddlers, and families experiencing homelessness. This includes um, child care development fund plans, which allow states flexibility to remove those barriers that Sarah mentioned, like families who cannot acquire documentation, birth certificates, or immunization records in time, states may expand um, the time that is allowed uh, in order to, to um, help those families submit those documents. States can also do other things like waive co-payments for families experiencing homelessness, which often makes the difference in families being able to enroll in a high quality program. And so as we observed, and as we noted in our 50 state profiles, we would love to see more states take full advantage of the maximum allowances that are offered to them through those programs. We also concluded with some recommendations, and there are actions at every level that can make the difference to removing barriers for families experiencing homelessness and leading to increased access to services for infants, toddlers, and their families. Um, we include some best practices for early childhood providers, but we focused our recommendations specifically at the federal, state, and congressional levels. And we encourage you to check out the full breadth of our recommendations um, but they all, again, are centered on how each stakeholder um, can be proactive in removing those barriers, including providing stronger oversight, providing greater data transparency, um, and strengthening those policies and practices at all levels. In just a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to our illustrious panelist for today. Um, and so as Thais gets ready to join us and share about their phenomenal work at our house, I wanna remind our participants that you can submit your questions through the Q&A box. I've already seen several come in. I have no doubt that as you hear from our house and as you hear from our Connecticut partners, you will have lots more questions. And so we'll reserve those for the end of our session. Um, so I encourage you to submit your questions throughout. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Thais Lawyer from Our House in Georgia. Thais, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah and Erin. That was a wonderful introduction and a great overview of the complexities of just trying to identify who, which families are experiencing homelessness. One of the things we talk about a lot are our need to continue to educate the general public that the families that we're serving are not the families that are visible. You won't see them under the bridge. They will find some place to go temporarily. And it's all the more reason our work is so very important. So I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about our house. <clears throat> Next slide. So the mission of our house is to provide transformative care to end the cycle of homelessness for families. And our vision is a healthy and self-sufficient family for all. Our work, next slide. Over the years, our work has really grown and evolved in direct response to the needs that we were seeing in the community. The federal government has put out their vision of Health, Healthy People 2030, which really talks about the social determinants or the social drivers of health. And our programs have grown and increased in depth and breadth really in response to all of these social determinants of health. We recognize that those experiencing homelessness face a complex set of challenges and issues and not everybody's path into a state of being unhoused is the same, nor is their path out of it the same. So we provide early childhood education, family shelter, workforce development and job training, family advocacy, rapid rehousing, and equitable health care, all of the things that were mentioned earlier that can impact the family's ability to provide stable housing for their children and a child's ability to grow and thrive. Next slide. Some barriers affecting our clients, as was mentioned earlier, 
trans lack of transportation, lack of access and burdensome eligibility requirements, low income unemployment, health literacy and knowledge to navigate healthcare systems. If we can't get our children seen, if we don't have the immunizations, they can't enroll in school. Mental illness and complex trauma. For us at our house, this has become an increasing challenge for us um, as we move out of the pandemic environment, its impact continues to be visible in our families and in our children. Um, also poor experience with other providers. There's a lack of trust, um, not being willing to share the story so that we can provide the appropriate resources to help families move forward and then limited networks of social support. All of these work together to contribute to challenges that our families see. Again, we have our human services programming, which is our early education and our housing, our employment services and our family services, which is really those wraparound case management services that we provide to parents to help them develop a goal plan and to set a path forward toward achieving the goals in their plan. So we serve 636 individuals in our human service programs, 96 families, and 90% of the participants we see identify as Black. 96% actually identify as single female-headed households. In our early childhood education program, when we served 106 children from 75 families, 81% were enrolled, who were enrolled six months or more are developmentally on track. <clears throat> we measure that through in the first day, 30 days, we do a baseline assessment, and then we use ASQ, the ages and stages, and then we use ages and stages, the social emotional, to really measure progress over time in our children we develop individualized child care plans for each child. We work on those developmental milestones where we see they need the most support. 88% uh, of our pre-K students tested as ready for kindergarten. We use the Scholastic Kindergarten Readiness Test to measure that. And in Georgia, we actually have a summer transition program that is funded through our state pre-K programming that allows us to work with those students who had more needs or who did not have the opportunity to be in pre-K all year long so that we have that extra time to work with them to prepare them for their kindergarten experience. We also teach the Child Development Associate course. We provide primarily participants who are currently experiencing homelessness an opportunity to work to earn the national CDA credential. We teach the 120 clock hours and we provide an internship for the 480 hours of work experience within our classrooms and those of partner classrooms. Um, so we had a 75% graduation rate last year, 100% of those students obtain the CDA. And we do more than just teach the curriculum for the CDA. We provide a workshop series around job resume, job readiness, resume building, balancing work and life, we also do what we call reflection sessions, and that actually provides the students an opportunity to talk about the struggles and challenges they're facing. It is a more supportive way to obtain the CDA, and because we target our families and our participants currently experiencing homelessness, we recognize that they need that extra support to and those attaboys, quite honestly, to be able to finish the course and to sit for the test. We pay for the test, we pay for stipends, and then our hope and our goal is that by placing them in partner programs, they have increased opportunities to be hired immediately upon graduation. In our housing program, we served 154 families. 60%, <clears throat> excuse me, of the house families maintain that housing three months or more. I'm sorry, 60% of the 154 were successfully housed and maintained that housing three months or more. Um, and 80% who were referred for mental health services were connected and attended three or more sessions. I mentioned earlier that we have been seeing a lot more mental health challenges in our parent population. And so we started 
being creative about ways to reduce that stigma and make the connection. We do a series of group workshops that is really around educating about what mental health services are. And then we work with them to connect them with a provider and ask them just to do three sessions to get a feel for it. We talk about what did they learn? What did they experience? Again, that, that stigma can be a very real barrier, but we know that unless we address some of the underlying challenges families are facing, they'll continue to, to struggle with their stability. So we actually have HUD funding for our rapid rehousing program, and it allows us to pay rent for participants for up to a year. Our model right now is we support families as they move in, and we do a re gradually reducing amount of the actual rental support. One, to give them time to get stable for their income to increase, and then two, to sort of reinforce this idea of partnership. We're in this together. In 2022, we recognized that health was becoming an increasing challenges for families. And we had the opportunity to combine with an organization providing healthcare services. They were actually working out of one of our buildings already. And we actually merged with them and they became part of our house. It is a nurse-led practitioner model that really focuses on families and individuals experiencing homelessness and really provides whole person health care, which includes mental health services. So our nurse practitioners can practice within their license to provide an array of reproductive health, preventive health, mental health, school health services, and we also provide interprofessional education. We partner with Morehouse School of Medicine and Emory University here in Georgia to provide a community health experience for residents and nurse graduates. In addition to operating our main clinic, we provide services in our community at the Covenant House Shelter, Restoration House, which is a women and children shelter as well. Thrive Suite Auburn in our community is a new supportive housing project that came online late last year, and we provide services there one day a week for their participants. And the Atlanta Children's mm -hmm. Shelter is an early childhood education program for families experiencing homelessness. Next slide. So our team in our healthcare department is small and mighty. We serve 2,505 clients with a total of 5,000 plus encounters, and we had 50 plus health professions learners. That programming around the health profession learners is really important to us because we want to expose in healthcare providers to a community-based health model to hopefully increase their compassion, help them better learn about themselves, learn and experience what implicit biases they may bring to the table, and to have conversations with our providers who are in the work every day so that hopefully when they're out there practicing, they have these experiences to rely on and, and are able to act with more care and compassion for those clients who might not look like their normal population. If we have time, I do have a small video I can share um, with a testimony from one of our parents. That would be wonderful, Thais. Thank you so much. And let me know what you need from me to, in order to set that up. Uh, I think I just need permission to share. Okay. Bear with me just one moment, please. All right, Thais, let me know if you have the share screen option. Not yet. Let me stop my share. Okay. Nope. Did you make me a co-host maybe? I did. Let me try one more time here. Uh, let's see. Okay, yes, I see it. Perfect. All right, let's make that bigger. Her last appointment when she was still in here. Yes. Hold on, let's go back. 
Yeah. Two, um, we were in our own apartment. Uh, we faced an eviction um, around the time of maternity leave. It was a really unfair, unjust situation and couldn't go back to, you know, what was home for so long. Her, Literally her very before. last appointment when she was still in here. Yes. Her and doctor's schedule. appointment was less than an hour. We went to and came back, and by the time we made it back, everything was on the curb, just everywhere. Come to find our house as the best suit for us, seeing that this is a shelter for families. Uh, it's been a really positive experience um, while we were here. We were greeted as we were family by a lot of the staff members and and a lot of the residents, you know, gotten close and we would speak. And of course, we break bread together in the evening. So you, you end up getting friendships that you never know that you experience. I don't have anything bad to say. I just think that we have been as appreciative if not more, as we can be for the help that we've gotten from here. So we appreciate that, and they've been great to us. You can only do so much if you're in a position where you have to live with your children in a car. And I just, I was more than thankful just for not having to have my children sleeping in the car and trying to figure out how they're gonna, how they're gonna be comfortable. And when they gave us this room, it was a bed for him. A bed for her, a bed for us, and I couldn't have asked for no more than that. A great, just weight off of your shoulder as far as knowing where Simeon in heaven is going to sleep at night, not in the car. Absolutely. And then, like I said, the staff has been awesome. We feel like we're coming home, you know, in the evening after being at work. Like, the name is the awesome. The kids up from school. The name is awesome, man. It's, it's it, it, I think that's like one of the things, that, one of the things that probably was like a pushing force for us to get into our own house because uh, we we tell people we're on our way home, we say we're on the way to our house, yeah. and they think we're talking about our we house. No, we don't have a house. we don't have a house yet. <laughs> <laughs> the place where we live is called our house, and right. we're on our way to our house. So Absolutely. it was. It was an excellent experience, and like everyone and the, the staff was amazing. And I couldn't do nothing but thank God for here. Nothing else because I, we were still able to get out and still do stuff and have somewhere for our kids to sleep at the end of the night. You know, not mm. be out all day. Our kids in the car with us all day, sweating and hot and hungry. And this saved us from. A lot of that, while well, with children anyway, because it would probably been a, a, maybe a tad bit easier on us on us if it was just her and I. But yes, this was awesome for our children overall. I would say thank you, thank you, thank you to thank you. any and everybody that donated before we were here during the time we were here, and please continue. And please continue, continue because it's so many, so many. Yeah, I would say we are pretty much a, a success story from here because without our house we well, been, where we would be I'm not really sure yeah. I can't say that so and that's honestly I can't say what else we would be other than sleeping in our car so thank you mm -hmm. to everybody who's ever donated anything to our house and thank you And thank you for letting me share. I think that video is a great depiction of those who can often be unseen, but who have the self-determination to move forward. Well said, Thais. And that was the perfect testament to end your portion on. I, I just want to acknowledge you're getting so many accolades and affirmations and heart emoji, emojis and hand clap emojis and, and um well-deserved. Um, thank you so much for the work you do at our house and for sharing about your mission and how you provide such comprehensive supports. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, to our participants that we see your questions coming in and we will get to those. Um, but first, we want to make sure we are also hearing from our 
Connecticut colleagues. And so as I pull my slides back up here, I want to invite Dr. Shante Hanks and Karen Pascal to join and introduce yourselves and tell us about the Head Start on Housing program in Connecticut. Good afternoon. Thank you. Can everyone, can you see me? Well, good afternoon to all the participants in today's webinar and to all attendees. I'm excited to be participating and collaborating with the Schoolhouse Connection today. I'll uh, pass the vir uh, virtual mic over to Karen so she can introduce herself uh, and then we'll get started. Oh, by the way, I should introduce myself. I <laughs> Shante Hanks, and I uh, head up uh, Connecticut's Head Start on Housing. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Hanks. Hi, everybody, I'm Karen Pascale, and I am Connecticut's Head Start State Collaboration Office Director. And so my role is to connect our Head Start programs to state systems and services. So happy to be with you today. All righty, thank you, Karen. So let's get started. Um, let's talk about what we will be discussing today. We're gonna to talk about Head Start on Housing, which will uh, probably refer to HSOH. We love acronyms at the state. Um, why Head Start? We'll share some Connecticut data, the impact on children and families experiencing homelessness here in Connecticut. We'll talk about our partners and our process here, landlord recruitment, and we'll also speak about setting up uh, an HSOH partnership. Next slide. So this is an overview of the Head Start on Housing program. Uh, it was established in January of 2022 with the, the Connecticut Department of Housing, which we call DOH. And uh, we, we allocated housing vouchers for families whose children are experiencing, um, well, first of all, that are participating in Connecticut's Head Start HS and early Head Start programs. So you can read along, but what I wanted to share, as we all know, we've been talking about this, you've heard it, that over half of all homeless children in the United States are under the age of six. And here in Connecticut, over 5,000 are experiencing unstable homelessness. And of all these students, nearly 4,200 are students of color. We here at the state of Connecticut have been working collaboratively with the Department of Housing, Office of Early Childhood, State Department of Education, and the Connecticut Head Start Collaborative, along with our partners to ensure our children have a safe place to lay their heads at night, leave for school in the morning, and then return to. Connecticut's response to this issue is the Head Start on Housing Collaboration, and now it's a full program that started out as a uh, pilot in 2022. HSOH, um, as we've said, is, was launched in 2022, and it was by initially the Office of Early Childhood and the Department of Housing. And we will share some data um, uh, to talk about, you know, where we started, where we've been, where we're going. But before we do that, I want to uh, pass this uh, virtual mic to Karen Pascal, which will speak about why we chose Head Start. Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I usually start this out uh, when Dr. Hanks and I are presenting to uh, our Head Start programs and say, why not Head Start, right? As Sarah had shared earlier, children and families experiencing homelessness are categorically eligible for early Head Start and Head Start services. And with the two generational model, Head Start programs are just uniquely positioned to provide services to children and families experiencing homelessness. So some of those services include early learning and development. So as soon as children walk in the door to an early Head Start program, within 45 days, they're screened for developmental and sensory concerns. Early Head Start and Head Start educators are developing lesson experience plans. They're observing children on an ongoing basis to make sure that they're meeting their developmental milestones. In addition, they receive health and wellness services. So Head Start staff are making sure that children are up to date on their child well visits, on their immunizations, making sure they're connected to a dental home and to a medical home. 
and family well-being. So when children and families come into the program, Head Start programs have social service staff. Many of them are called family advocates. And so they meet with the families. They help them identify their strengths. They help them identify any of their needs. And most importantly, they help connect them to the systems and services where they'll long be helped after they leave our Early Head Start and Head Start programs. And also family engagement. So Head Start programs allow families to be engaged in many different aspects of the program. They serve on many committees. They serve on policy council but where they help drive uh, decisions about the program. So really it is the original two generational program and it made sense to start with Head Start. Next slide. So if you're familiar with Head Start, Head Start programs collect a lot of data. So annually, Head Start programs are completing a program information report, which we refer to as a PIR. So this is 2023 data, meaning it started for the 22-23 school year. And so in Connecticut, the total number of children experiencing homelessness that were served during an enrollment year was 441 children. So that's about 7.7% of the total number of children served for that school year. And then we also report on the number of families experiencing homelessness. So there are 420 families served. 119 of those families were able to acquire housing during the program year. So unfortunately, that means that 301 families did not acquire housing. And so the big picture, and, and I think Erin alluded to this as well, and this is from school year 2020, uh, 2021, there were a little over a million children aged, ages zero to six who experienced homelessness, but only about 44,000 of them were identified and enrolled in early Head Start and Head Start programs. Next slide, please. So this is for Shantae to share a little bit about our impact. All righty, thank you, Karen. So data, we talk about this all the time, how important the quantitative piece is. We know that we need that information to show the success of the program um, in order for us to uh, acquire uh, support from our legislators, from our, our federal agencies, because we are using HUD uh, housing choice vouchers better known as Section 8. So we understand the importance of that data, but we also understand the importance of the qualitative piece, which is the stories. So we will try our best to share both, but to start off with the quantitative. So during the pilot phase, 35 families were provided permanent housing vouchers through the Department of Housing's Rental Assistance Program, which we call RAP. We are the first in the nation to have such a program. And this is due by the innovation and passion of our governor, uh, Governor Lamont, uh, the Commissioner of Office of Early Childhood, which is Commissioner Beth Bai, and the Commissioner from the Department of Housing, which is Commissioner Salem Oscar Bruno. Uh, we were able to set aside these vouchers and work collaboratively with Head Start, and as, as well as our uh, one of our partners, which is uh, NCHEW, which they work with uh, folks on the ground. They, they assist us in um, landlord recruitment, realtor recruitment, and work um, day to day with our echo leads, which are our Head Start um, and early Head Start liaisons. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we go on. This year during phase two is what we call it, of the full program of the 23 Head Start grantees throughout the state of Connecticut, 19 have been trained and 18 have partnered with us. So that means we just have five left and I, I would venture to say, and I think Karen would agree with me, that we'll have all 23 grantees by the end of this year. It is important to note that we are able to acknowledge uh, both HUD and mckinney Vento definitions as for those that uh, were not fully aware of the difference in definition, Sarah shared that earlier, and we're able to encompass both when it comes to the Head Start on Housing program. So as of Friday, we have housed 73 families, and this translates to 161 children, 113 are Head Start or Early Head Start, and 48 were McKinney-Vento uh, age children. 
So what I love to say is that we are able to feed two birds with one seed here and that often the families have children that are early Head Start or Head Start age, but they also have siblings that are in K through 12. So we're able to also um, work to uh, decrease the amount of children in grade school that are experiencing homelessness or unstable housing as well. Um, also, you can find this information. We're very transparent. You can find this information on our website. We'll put it in the chat under uh, data where we have a dashboard that we update uh, weekly. And not only does it have this data in terms of um, uh, the amount of families, the ages of children or what have you, but we also have demographics as well, which is, as we know, very useful information. So it will tell you where in the state um, these families are, are housed, uh, which Head Start programs, and it also will break down uh, ethnic backgrounds of these families as well. Next slide. And you can see that here illustrated. This is the state of Connecticut map, um, the large state that we are, <laughs> but uh, we love it. And you can see here where our families um, have been housed. We understand we are we are a microcosm of the real world. So you can use our program as a launching pad for yours. Um, because we know that this is, when we're talking throughout the country, over a million children between zero and six are experiencing homelessness. We want to be able to help you replicate uh, this program. So I, I think we probably could sit here just for a second so you can take it all in. Okay. So next slide, and we'll we'll share this information with you uh, so you'll have it. I know that's a lot to try and take in that slide of all that information in slide seven, but um, for the interest of time, and like I said, we're very transparent. So you'll receive these slides as, and you also have access to our dashboard. As Karen is speaking next about families and partners behind the vouchers, I will type in the chat our website. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hanks. So um, as Dr. Hanks mentioned, the quantitative data is so very important. And I just wanna note that of the 113 early Head Start and Head Start children that have been housed, to Aaron's point earlier, 82 of those have been infants and toddlers. So a significant portion have been infants and toddlers. So these are some of our families and partners behind the scene. We have Megan and Donald who were housed in New Haven, uh, Connecticut um, with their children and they um, had moved from hotel to hotel. So they were so happy to finally have a, a safe and stable home to call their own. We have Dr. Monette Ferguson. Um, so one of the pioneers behind some of this work in Connecticut from a Head Start program in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So we're so thankful for their partnership. And that is one of the families served at Dr. Ferguson's program in Bridgeport, Erica and her son. So you can actually learn more about the families and the partners. Um, we do have videos on our website. We have a, a video that shares about the entire Head Start program. And then we also have a video that does a follow-up. So several of our families were originally housed. And so they just renewed their lease. And I think that really speaks volumes to the work that is happening with both the landlords and the Head Start program. So they were able to renew their lease for a second year with the same landlord. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, here are all of the different partners. I think most important, of course, are our Head Start, early Head Start programs, children and families right at the top of the list. Uh, the Connecticut Department of Housing, which is providing the vouchers for this program. The Connecticut Office of Early Childhood. So in Connecticut, we have an Office of Early Childhood that houses many of the early childhood programs um, that serve children and families. The Head Start State Collaboration Office, our partner, the State Department of Education for serving all of those siblings of our Head Start and Early Head Start children. 
The Connecticut Head Start Association, which had been an integral partner in getting this off of the ground, and of course, the National Center for Housing and Child Welfare. Um, so they, as Dr. Hang said, shared are very vital to this role of supporting our Head Start programs, children and families with applications, um, with securing units. So we're very thankful for all of those partners. Next slide, please. And I'll pass it to Dr. Hanks for talking about our partnership. Thanks, Karen. So I, I said we talk about, you know, a little bit more detail um, about some more of the qualitative, as Karen said. Let's also talk about um, just some of the, the nuances involved with starting a program, right? I saw the comment about, um, and it's hard for me to ignore because <laughs> I know we're going to do Q&A, but I can answer that question. Uh, because we're working with Early Head Start, moms that are expecting can sign up. So we actually have housed a few families that the mom hasn't given birth as yet. So that is possible as well. We understand that we want children to be birthed into a stable housing environment. So um, to your point, um, yes, I we hear you um, and we're acknowledging that uh, that's from Abby. So setting up the partnership, you can reach out to your Head Start Collaborative Office, which every state has one. So we understand that every state, we've already been talking to some states, we've traveled um, and met with folks, we've presented. So we understand every state is not the same. Every state does not have a Department of Housing. Every state does not have an Office of Early Childhood, but every state does have a Head Start State Collaborative Office. And um, you have some form of a Department of Education and you all have housing authorities, right? So even though you may not have a state agency, an overarching agency to um, be able to administer the statewide uh, vouchers that we're able to use, your uh, respective housing authorities can do so. And the thing is, because these are uh, housing choice vouchers, better known as Section 8, we know that that can be done. Uh, the respective housing authorities can adjust their uh, or, or modify their admin um, their admin uh, program so that they can allow for set asides and possibly start a pilot. We uh, we initially started a pilot with our wrap and we quickly utilized those and moved into Section Eight vouchers. So you can modify your admin plan to accommodate this program, and we can talk more about that. So start the conversations with your public housing agency directors and talk about, you know, setting aside and what available vouchers they may have. Um, let's see, build it in phases like a pilot, start there. Uh, let's see, forming those partnerships and relationships with landlords, real estate agents, et cetera. That's important. You cannot underestimate that. Uh, we have outreach. We, we actually are very... Uh, deliberate um, about our, our outreach and it's equal. It's it's the landlords and the realtors. We found that if anything, that's probably going to be one of your bigger challenges because you're, um, the audience that you're working with, right? They're not gonna have, it's less than likely they're going to have stellar credit. So you have those challenges, right? You're out there competing with uh, the cash offers. You're competing with folks that have stellar credit and then you're, you're possibly competing with other folks with a voucher from other programs. So what you need to do is build those relationships with your landlords, um, even with developers before those properties are even built, you know, get, get in front of them and say, listen, we have this program. I mean, you really have to appeal to their values. That's where the qualitative part comes in the stories. And you'd be surprised at how many people really can relate and identify once they know the story. And with us, we also make it very clear that this person may have a 700, 800 credit score, but you're coming, this family's coming with the power of three state agencies, as well as our partners and Head Start. So to me, that's invaluable. And it typically does work. Um, I actually, I can't think of any instance where, um, you know, we really had a problem. I mean, we we really, we're also relentless. We, we really, really are passionate about what we do. We believe in what we do. And because we have, t um, we have landlords that are willing to um, come to the table, go to bat for us and say, listen, we support you. We're advocating for you. We love the program. We love the support. And you really get to see up close and personal 
the effects, the impact that you're having on these children and, and their parents. It's it's really a no brainer in our opinion. And, and so far so good considering this is a new program and, and we know how difficult it can be to be the first. So you can use us as an example. Um, what we also found as a challenge, and these are realistic, I don't mean to sound Pollyanna here because there, there are some real challenges that we just we just had to meet, for example, security deposits. I mean, the the idea of having three times the rent, it, it's just unrealistic, right? So what we were able to do was incorporate Head Start on Housing into our, um, our MAP program, which is our moving assistance program. And it's funded by some of the funding that we have left over from ARPA funds for um, rental assistance and it moved into eviction pre eviction prevention. And now we're able to also use some of that funding for security deposits. That is huge because that also uh, makes us that more competitive because we actually, these security deposits go directly to the landlords and they don't have to wait. We can turn this around. We're getting better about seven to 10 days and they'll get that security deposit. So that um, that's definitely like gold for us. Um, uh, inventory we know across the country, affordable housing, um, it's, it's just, there's a shortage. So there is that. Um, so the more outreach you do, the more folks like yourselves that we get in front of, there's over 500 people participating today. We have a statewide event tomorrow. So the more people that hear of your program, the better. The more relationships you build, the better. I mean, we have a, a spreadsheet where we can see developments that will not be will be done within the next six months, but we already know, we're already in front of that. So that's really important. Um, I can't say it enough, it's the outreach and building relationships and partnerships. That's so very important. And the last slide, um, well, next slide on that is, is, is the outreach portion. You have to constantly work at it. So we have flyers with QR codes where, um, we reach out to landlords and we also have on our website that you can fill out a form. Those emails come directly to me where landlords are interested, they wanna know more. And, and I immediately respond to them, a real person, um, as well as parents or families. There's also a little form on our website that they can inquire. Ideally, the referrals do come from our Head Start partners, but as you know, there's, you know, because of the word of mouth and, and the outreach that we're doing, we're going to hear from faith-based leaders. We're going to hear from legislators. We're going to, you know, they're going to get the word out to their constituents and family and friends or whatever the case may be. So we may have to do the matchmaking the opposite way. It really, you know, it, it it's really not a big deal. It's not a, a, a heavy lift for us because ultimately we just wanna make sure that we're housing these families and, and these children. Um, next slide. So to learn more, <laughs> this is my contact information as well as Karen's contact information and our website. So you can get in contact with us directly either way by going through the website or emailing us directly for, for more questions um, that you may have. But I believe we have enough time. I think, I know we're, we're hitting that four o'clock, but Erin, you tell me, do we have time to field questions? We absolutely do. And I would love to um, invite Thais and Sarah back into the conversation. And let me just double check Dr. Hanks and Karen and make sure this is a good pause point. And I would love to turn us to our Q&A now. And I can start walking us through those. Um, I do want to thank our participants um, for submitting um, so many questions so far. Our Q&A box will continue to remain open. So if you do have additional questions, we encourage you to submit them. I want to start with um, uh, some data questions that um, we at Schoolhouse can answer. Um, there's a question that came in about um, asking, can you talk about how local education agencies are supposed to be identifying kids zero to three? When I think of LEAs, I'm usually thinking of school districts who usually serve older, toddlers, and K-12. Thank you so much for that question. That's a great opportunity to clarify some of the data points. Um, under the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, uh, school district liaisons are required to identify and refer younger children experiencing homelessness to early childhood development programs. In the past, that data has been collected for the population of children ages three through five. 
Recently, the U.S. Department of Education has collected and published on Ed Data Express information on children ages birth through two as well. And so the first year for which that data is available, I believe, is the 21 to 22 school year. And I should note that um, the require or the implementation of this requirement varies across states and school districts. And so um, that data is very likely an undercount of younger children who are experiencing homelessness. But I do want to emphasize that that is a requirement of all school district liaisons, whether or not the child is school age, if they become aware of a younger child experiencing homelessness, they are at the very least to identify and make every effort to ensure that child and their family are referred to early childhood development programs. Similarly, on the data piece, I want to acknowledge another question that came in asking, can you describe your process to collect data from states and their lack of ability to provide data from CCDF, child care funding for homeless infants and toddlers? This is a great question, and I, I want to acknowledge that data collection is tricky um, everywhere. And um, uh, Schoolhouse Connection previously uh, published a report that just analyzed 20 states for the program year 2020 to 2021. For that program year, we were able to obtain data from the Office of Child Care showing not only how many children uh, who access child care subsidy were experiencing homelessness, but it was disaggregated by age um, to, to encompass that birth through three age range. Unfortunately, due to capacity issues, we were not able um, to, uh, the Office of Child Care was not able to provide that data to us this time. And we do recommend in our report um, that there be greater data transparency across all agencies. Um, you can certainly go to the Office of Child Care's website to access um, a, an aggregate percentage of all children experiencing homelessness who are enrolled in a child care subsidy program. But it's worth noting that that includes children up to age 12. And so it really doesn't help us narrow down the impacts and access for infants and toddlers in particular. We are hopeful that there will be ways and um, levers that we can help our friends at the federal level level um, access to in order to be able to publish that data more widely and more transparently. Um, I will also put in a nod here that this is why we love, one of the reasons why we love Head Start, the program information report that Karen alluded to is publicly accessible, it's very up to date, and it's very easy to pull your state's data directly. And so that is where we access our early Head Start data on families experiencing homelessness. So I wanted to take the opportunity to clarify some data pieces there. Um, and now I want to get into um, the real good questions for the real experts here, our presenters who have joined us today. Um, and I want to start with you, Thais, and bring you back in. There was a question for you asking, is the early childhood program at our house just for those staying in the shelter, or is it open to the public, in, in other words, those who are not staying in the shelter? Sure, great. But first two things. One, I'm a Head Start graduate. Um, and two, our programs, we are partnering with some federal grantees to provide Head Start, Early Head Start services at some of our sites. So we actually have three early learning sites. One of them is in the same facility as our Shelter for Families, which makes access even easier for those families. But any family can access any of our three sites. Our eligibility is really around currently experiencing or at risk of homelessness which we define very broadly because again, it's a complex set of issues. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to invite Karen and Dr. Hanks back in. We're getting some questions. And Dr. Hanks, thank you so much for clarifying that Early Head Start does serve expectant parents. Um, and that is important to note. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that. We do have um, a couple questions and comments that have come in through the chat. And I'm wondering if one or both of you could speak to this. Um, given what Sarah shared earlier about the developmental impacts of homelessness on infants and toddlers, what does happen um, when you uh, are working with a family experiencing homelessness or not, um, who needs early intervention services. Can you talk a little bit about how you are providing those services through Early Head Start and Head Start, and if you are seeing anecdotally um, more prevalence among your children experiencing homelessness? 
Sure, so I can start off, Dr. Hanks, and if you want to add anything. And so all of our Head Start programs, as they screen early, um, as they screen their infants and toddlers in, within 45 days, they all have their own internal processes. So if a child doesn't pass a screening, they may rescreen in two to four weeks. Um, and then they would make a referral with the family to birth to three, which is uh, the state agency in Connecticut that's implementing Part C um, of IDEA. Um, and so early head start and birth to three have a statewide MOU. And so if a child is determined eligible for services, um, the early interventionist is able to come to the early head start program, work with the child and family right in the classroom. Um, so we're really fortunate that we have such a great partnership there. Um, and as far as some anecdotal data, data, I think we could certainly get back to you on that. Um, we're working with our partner, the National Center, to um, send out a survey. Um, so that will go directly to our Head Start programs um, to see uh, just how are the children doing, right, once they've acquired housing. The good thing is that they do have early Head Start, right? So they have that continuity. They're there every day. Thank you so much for that. And Thais, I want to invite you in to share anything from your perspective at our house on the developmental impact piece of this. Sure. So similarly, we screen all of our children and we make referrals to Baby Can't, Babies Can't Wait, who is our Part C provider here in Georgia, um, and really work to bring the services in. Unfortunately, in our state, there is somewhat of a backlog. So one of our other prevention and intervention strategies is we partner with an agency called the Adaptive Learning Center, and they provide inclusion specialists who are able to help not only the student, but to provide our teachers with additional strategies to help the student gain the developmental milestone that's needed next. Some of the challenges we experience are experiential, and we know that. And so we're very careful to tailor the individualized education plan to give the students the appropriate experiences um, and then work with the Part C provider when we realize that the services are needed are much more in depth. Thank you so much. I have at least two additional questions that I want to get to. This next one I'm going to offer as a toss up, whoever would like to jump in first. Um, we have some comments and questions wondering about um, partnerships beyond housing, but particularly job training. And so I want to invite um, either or all of you um, to share how you're able to connect families to partners, but for job training in particularly. Oh, I, I, I can't believe I did mention this. This is mm -hmm. um, one of the, I don't know, major hallmarks I feel like about being able to use these Section 8 vouchers. And the, all of us that work in housing um, or in social services, we know that oftentimes Section 8 comes with this negative connotation. Um, I was excited when we were able to transition from the RAP vouchers into Section 8 because that means that we can utilize the FSS program, the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. And with that means that we can help with uh, job training, education, um, financial education, as well as um, transportation. Some families have purchased their first car. And um, for me, the one that I wanna really hang my hat on is helping them own their first home. And we also have a program in Connecticut with um, CHAFA, which is our kind of our, our home buying financial and development arm, so to speak. It's um, our non-governmental agency that we work with uh, directly here in Connecticut, and many states have them. Um, CHAFA has a program for first-time home buyers from Connecticut where we match you with your down payment. So we're able to dovetail these programs through FSS. So that's that's what ultimately, but we have to start off taking baby steps, pun intended, right? So we have also here in Connecticut um, workforce housing programs. So let's say, um, you know, there's someone that is in the middle of training. Like there's a young lady that reached out to me that she's starting a CNA program. We are able to, um, help her where we can pay and it's it's every three months you have to you know resubmit so that to see that you're eligible we can pay her rent 
during that time while she's in the CNA program. So she may not necessarily need um, a voucher per se because she already has housing, but she may be on the on the cusp of losing that housing or you know unable to cover all of her expenses or what have you while she's going to school full time. So we're able to provide that subsidy during that time. So we're, we're looking at various ways because we know that there's no one silver bullet, right? That fits all. Um, so we're trying to help because ultimately we want this to be long-term. We want the stability to be long-term for the families. So that's how we're looking at it. So between FSS and then this is in Connecticut, uh, the, the workforce uh, program, but FSS is a, a HUD program. So every organization, every state that starts this program, that pilots this program can transition into FSS for the participants. And so, and for us, we approach it through, of course, our own training program. And we recognize that not everybody wants to work with young children or should. And so in order to expose our participants to other employment opportunities, we work with some of our local agency like First Step Staffing, which is an agency that provides employment reentry services for low income and at risk of homeless, homeless individuals. We also do some work with Goodwill in our in our area that really does provide sort of the broad-based job training services. And we are actually looking at trying, we have a commercial kitchen in one of our sites. And so we're looking at ways to maybe do some training in culinary services and really help people at least get the serve safe certification and get them some experience working in the kitchen environment. That's all wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. I have one last question for our panelists before we profusely thank them um, for today and, and conclude our session. And I'll start with you, Karen and Dr. Hanks, and then Thais will give you the last word. Um, I, I think our audience wants to know, I would love to know, what more do you need to continue serving infants, toddlers, and expectant parents experiencing homelessness? I would say um, support and, and always we're going to need funding because um, right, right now it, it's it's the outreach piece. It's, you know, but even doing that, it, it costs money. And this money that we have, the ARPA is not going to last always. So that support, the more we do with the outreach, the more um, support, more funding, and we can build uh, private part uh, private and public partnerships that's a big thing for us here. And we're doing that, for example, with our developers, um, letting them know about this program that exists. So even if they're looking at building all market rate housing, we're still saying, listen, we have this program and you know, we're trying to get them early to get on board. Um, so I would say that, and I do see someone in, uh, <laughs> someone, I know that person, uh, <laughs> we need units with exclamation point. Absolutely. We do it. And we're probably, you know, preaching to the choir. We can say that across the country, we need more affordable units. So that's why we're grabbing the developers. That's the advantage of our program, um, having this collaboration uh, between the three agencies, in particular, the Office of Early Childhood, as well as the Department of Housing. Having the Department of Housing at the table makes all the difference. I'm not just saying that because that's where my office actually is. Uh, my desk um, is in the Department of Housing. I say that though, because by having that partnership where we bring the vouchers to the table, we bring the developers and those relationships to the table, that may not happen everywhere. But if for any of, of you that are, are on today that are sitting in different states that you do have, and a, a Department of Housing or um, your housing authorities have a, a developmental arm and you can build those relationships, bring your legislators to the table. That will make all the difference. It's all the same, you know, it, it's the same pool. Don't try and do this in a silo. Don't try and do this, um, you know, without talking to everyone. Get everyone involved because this impacts everyone at the end of the day. Right, we're trying to change. Um, this is a generational thing. We're trying to change things for for these young people, the trajectory of their lives, the quality of their lives, um, and it 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 works both ways with the children as well as their parents. 
So I'll, I'll add just ditto to everything Dr. Hank said um, and really sort of help us focus on equity, access, and inclusion, right? So a lot of the challenges we are facing are systemic in nature and the willingness of people to approach legislators to bring the issue to the forefront, just general awareness um, about some of the challenges you know, I personally sit on an infant toddler mental health co coalition. I sit on a child care advocacy and access coalition, really being able to tell the story in as many venues as possible, um, being unafraid to maybe write letters to legislatures around what you're seeing in your community and affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. <laughs> there are just not enough units across the country, as Dr. Hank said. I would love to thank our panelists once again for your time, your expertise, and most importantly, for everything you're doing every day for families, infants, and toddlers experiencing homelessness. So many accolades and cheers and emojis from our audience today as well. I want to remind our audience that this webinar has been recorded. It will be on our archived webinars page. You will also receive a follow-up email um, with the slides and the recording as well. We encourage you um, to continue um, digging through the report, look at the data for your state to learn more about how many infants and toddlers are experiencing homelessness and how they're able to access early childhood development programs. And as always, you can reach out to us at Schoolhouse Connection with any questions or for more resources. I want to thank everyone for joining today's conversation. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.